All right. Well, welcome again. My name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Washington Heights, Washington Heights Church, and I'm so glad you chose to join us this morning. Uh, if you've seen me teach uh, in big church before, you know I love to use uh, stories as part of my application. And as I was preparing to teach today, we're in the middle of a series called The Shadow King, where we're kind of walking through the book of 1 Samuel. And I pulled the lucky straw and pulled the story of uh, David and Goliath from uh, 1 Samuel uh, 17. And as I was preparing for this, I thought, this is a natural passage for me to tell a great story. But then it occurred to me, anyone who's been around this thing called the church for any length of time has probably heard this story a lot. <laughs> and so I could retell the story uh, in my own words, but I thought I would do something uh, a little different for me ordinarily, that we would just walk through kind of chapter and verse of these pages because I think this book tells the story even better than I could. So if you brought your Bibles with you this morning, you can open up to 1 Samuel 17, starting in verse 1. If you brought your, uh, your flat screens, you know, go ahead and open the Bible app, 1 Samuel 17, starting at verse 1. Uh, I'll give you just a minute to do so um, as we get started. So uh, 1 Samuel 17, 1, it starts off. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at Succah, which belongs to Judah, and camp between Succah and Ezekiah and Ephes Damon. Let's pause for a second and get our J. High giggles out, because I just said Succah and Damon right out of the Bible. <laughs> I'm a youth pastor. Here we go. Okay, so... <laughs> Uh, verse 2, and Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and encamped in the valley of Allah and drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley in between them. And there came out of the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath. Everyone go, dum, dum, dum. <laughs> right, here he comes. Here's the villain. We're going to describe Goliath. Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and one span, and you know how big that is. No? A uh, little over nine feet. This was a big guy. He had a helmet of bronze on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. For those of you who don't know, that's about 120 pounds. And he had a bronze, uh, uh, bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And the staff, uh, shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. And uh, the spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. Now I'm going, how can I properly paint the picture of how big this javelin was? And so I Googled. <laughs> That's what we do. How, <laughs> ordinary, everyday things that weigh 15 to 16 pounds. And my favorite one that came up on this everyday list was a vacuum cleaner. Yeah. I don't use it much, but vacuum cleaners apparently weigh 15 to 16 pounds. And to paint the picture, here's this nine foot tall guy. He's got 120 pounds of armor on. He's got a, a javelin or a spear that has a vacuum cleaner on the end of it that he just likes to dart around and fling at people. I thought I'd take you guys back to old time Sunday school. Anyone grew up in the church? You guys, all right, okay, just me, that's fine. I'll share my childhood with you. Growing up in Sunday school, <clears throat> we, we had the flannel graphs, right? You guys remember these? Had the flannel graphs. So I've got, uh, I've got uh, I don't know if it's actually David, but a little guy that looks kind of like David. And here's Goliath of Gath, Goliath. <laughs> there he is. Oh, and he's got, I love it. He's got his sword. Oh, I'm gonna die. And then he's got his giant javelin with a vacuum cleaner on the end of it. And there's, uh, there he is, right? It looks intimidating. <laughs> it's frightening. <laughs> no? Yeah, I didn't think so as a kid either. <laughs> I remember looking at it going, well, wait, he doesn't look, like if he's a teenager, he's not that much bigger than him. Like, I feel like he could take him. <laughs> I thought I'd um, make a flannel graph of my own to share with you this morning just how big Goliath really was. Hang on, watch this, watch this. I'll be right back. Hang on here. Okay. I'm going to get him. Here's my, anyone have a piece of felt? I got to stick this to, okay. So, uh, Life-size representation of Goliath of Gath. Now, I'm six foot tall. This Goliath is nine feet tall, and he was actually a little bit taller than this. This one doesn't have feet. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know why he doesn't have feet, but he doesn't have feet. David 
Uh, we believe he was a teenager at, uh, during these verses, somewhere between 15 and 19 years old. Um, he probably stood slightly shorter than I am. And you can see this intimidating, menacing character. And I wanted to paint this picture so you had like this really locked into your mind of what it was David was looking at and why this was terrifying. All right, I'm gonna put Goliath to bed. Here you go, all right, stay. Okay. I'm gonna keep an eye on you. All right, here we go. So that's David. That's not David, that's Goliath. You guys were with me. <laughs> so he and his shield bearer went before him. I like to think of a shield bearer as like an arrow catcher. <laughs> like just, all right, just me. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you, that's my Goliath voice, <laughs> Why have you come out to draw for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul and all Israel heard the words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, if you were with us last week when Pastor Mike taught, he taught out of 1 Samuel 16, and it was a story of Samuel anointing David as the future king. And we see some similarities here, and I think it's intentional that we find in the first 11 verses of 1 Samuel 17, kind of a recap of maybe what we saw in 1 Samuel 16. If you remember, Samuel shows up to Jesse's house, and he says, I'm here to anoint one of your sons as king, and he brings out his oldest son, Eliab, and Samuel thinks that that's him. He looks like a king. He has the stature and the stance of a king, and God says, no, not him. Not him and not the next one and the next one and the next one. And finally, so do you have any other sons? Well, there's the runt, Jesse, out watching the, the, the sheep. And he painted a picture in 1 Samuel 16 that God's not looking at external appearances. He's looking at what's in the heart. And here in the first 11 verses of 1 Samuel 17, it's almost like he's recapping it. It's like he's seeing if we were paying attention in, verse six, in chapter 16, so he recaps it in the opening of 17. Are you paying attention? And Saul and the Israel army heard the words of the Philistine and they were dismayed and greatly afraid. They're not quite getting it yet. Now David was the son of an Ephrathite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name, whose name was Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. And the three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the oldest, we remember him, and uh, next to him, Abdim, Ab, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest follow Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. We know from earlier that David was in the service of the king. He had this part-time gig at the, at the palace. Because uh, God's spirit had left Saul because Saul disobeyed. And so he had fits of evil spirits. And they would bring David in to play his lyre, his guitar, his harp, whatever. It was a stringed instrument of some kind and it would soothe the king. But he wasn't there all the time. It says he went back and forth. So at this particular point in time, the king is out at battle. He doesn't need David. And so David is back home tending the sheep of his father, Jesse. For 40 days, the Philistine came forward and took his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an epath of this parched grain and these 10 loaves and carry them quickly to the camp for your brothers. Also, take these 10 cheeses to the commander of their thousand. See if your brothers are well and bring some token of them. All right, so Jesse, his boys are off to war with the king. He's got his youngest boy tending the sheep and it's been 40 days. It's been over a month since he's heard from his kids. 
Now, you have to remember, back in this timeline, uh, battles generally went like this. Uh, we line our army up on this hill. You line your army up on that hill. We're going to blow the trumpets and blow the horns. We're going to make a mighty war cry. We're all going to rush down into the valley. There's going to be slashing and bashing and punching and kicking. And whoever's left standing at the end, they're the winner. But it didn't take 40 days. It was over in an instant, sometimes days. But most of the time, it didn't take that long. And here, Jesse... It's been over a month, and he hasn't heard from his kids. And so he sends David, take these provisions, give some to your brother, give some to their commander, and find out what's going on, and come back and tell me how they're doing. And so David rose up early. We're in uh, verse 20. In the, rose up in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to the battle line, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. So here's this picture. David just got there. Everyone's lining up. They've done this for 40 days already. And here comes Goliath. I think he probably had Michael Buffer announcing for him. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> introducing the world champion of the world, undefeated, undisputed, standing in at nine feet, five inches tall, weighing 500 pounds, Goliath, the Philistine from Gath. <laughs> and all the men of Israel when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And 40 days and 40 nights, this has gone on. And see, back in the day, like one side sends out their big guy, it's natural that the other side would send out their big guy. Now in Israel, who was their big guy? It was Saul. The Bible tells us he stood head and shoulders above the rest. This was his place. He was the king. It was his responsibility to go and fight. But because the Lord's spirit had removed itself from him, he no longer had the courage to do so. And he hung back behind the lines, terrified and afraid. And it was so bad, he started offering a reward. Hey, anyone want to go fight that guy? You want to go fight that guy? Anyone? No one want to go? All right. What if I uh, made you, I'll make you rich. You want, I'll make you rich. Anyone? No one want, no one want, gas, uh, I'll give you a tank of gas. No one? <laughs> Anyone want to go? Nobody wants to go? Okay. Nobody takes him up on it. So he ups the ante. He goes, okay, I'll tell, you, I'll tell you what. I'll give you that. I'll give you that tank of gas and the hand of one of my daughters in marriage. You can come into this royal family. You can be a part of this. Anyone? No takers? Nobody wants to go. Okay. Okay, I'm going to go crazy. I'm going to go over the top with this. I'll give you riches, I'll give you the hand of my daughter, and no taxes for your entire family for the rest of your life. Who's my taker? No one. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who comes up? Surely he's come up to defy Israel, and the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. And David said to the men who stood by him, wait, what? <laughs> David, somewhere between 15 and 19 years old, he's the youngest of eight brothers. There's not a lot of opportunity that he's looking forward to as far as wealth within his family because the oldest brother gets the lion's share and whatever's left gets divvied out between the, the remaining brothers in birth order. He's number eight. He's at the end of the line. He's used to being out in the fields tending the sheep. This is where he ranks, 15-year-old guy. Wait, what will the king do? He's going to give him money and a girl? I get money and a girl? <laughs> What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Circle, highlight, underline, if you're paying attention, if you're a highlighter. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? Circle, highlight, underline. Wait, I can get money and the girl? 
but his heart's still right. It's still, this is God's army. Like this, he's defying God. He's not defying David. He's not defying King Saul. He's defying the very living God. And so the people answered him in the same way. So shall it be done twice. Twice in, in a couple of verses. Wait, what does he get? Money and the girl? <laughs> That's my 15-year-old boy voice. What? Money and the girl? I hope you're down for that. Now Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. <laughs> Anyone have siblings? I, I, I relate to this in the realest way. I was the youngest of three kids. My brother. Why have you even come down here? What are you doing here? Who have you left those few sheep with? It's like you can tell where he's at. And like when I first read this, I'm going, why is Eliab so mad? But then I remember chapter 16, where Eliab got passed over and had to stand there and watch his youngest brother get anointed as the future king. Oh, I get it. I know the evil of your heart. And you've just come down to see the battle. And David said, here's his youngest brother response. What have I done? I'm just talking to people. I haven't done anything. Why are you coming at me? And then he turned away from him toward and spoke to another person in the same way. And the people answered him again. Three times in these short verses, David goes, what does he get? He gets money and a girl? Money and a girl? Money and a girl? And when the words that David spoke were heard, they repeated them before Saul. And Saul goes, wait, someone wants to do it? Bring him. Who's going to? All right, yeah, bring him. Let's talk to that guy. And he comes before Saul. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Yeah, I'll go fight him. I'll go fight him. Money and a girl? <laughs> and Saul said to David, <laughs> You're not able to go against this Philistine. You, look, you're, you're just a kid. You're just a youth. This guy's been a man of war since his youth. You're, you can't fight this guy. And he was right. There was no way David could fight this guy. But David said to Saul, I love this part, 15-year-old. David said to Saul, look, uh -huh. <laughs> your servant's been a shepherd since he was young. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> Like I, I still wanted Saul to respond, and? <laughs> like, what does it take to be a shepherd? You watch sheep. What does that take? Eyes. <laughs> David says, your servant used to keep sheep for his father, and when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered it out of his mouth. And if he rose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both lions and bears, and this uncircumcised Philistine shall be like one of them, for he has defied the armies of the living God. Circle, underline, highlight. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, all right, Lord be with you. And I probably didn't say it like that. <laughs> and then so Saul, he said, all right, I'm going I'm to let the kid go. He really wants to do it. What could happen? I feel like it's fine. And so he says, he's going to send this teenager. But he says, I can't send you out like this. Like, you got to have armor, and I got to give you a helmet and a sword. And so he, like, clothes David with his own armor. He put a helmet of bronze on his head and clothed him with a full coat of mail. And David strapped the sword over his armor, and he tried in vain to go, for he had not tested them. And I picture, like, like I work with teenage boys all the time. I, and, and, like, some 15-year-olds are, you know, pretty uh, advanced. They've grown up a lot. But there's a lot of 15-year-old boys that are just scrawny. And maybe David, like maybe David was one of them. And he's like, I can't even move in this. I mean, how am I supposed to fight? No, this isn't going to work. I haven't tested these. So David put them off, then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose five small stones, uh, five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in his shepherd's pouch. His sling was in his hand, and he approached the Philistine. Now, pause for a second. Um, I used to always read this and think, uh, five smooth stones. Why five? I don't know. But he chose five. And the smooth stones, I used to always picture like those river rock that we have in our, you know, our gardens, those decorative little black round ones that you're great for skipping stones. From. Like, I used to always think that. I'm like, that doesn't seem so violent. But then I read while I was studying this that they've uh, done archaeology in the Valley of Allah and they've uncovered what they believe were stones that were used in shepherd's slings. And they are round and they are smooth so that they maintain maximum velocity. But they're anywhere from the size of a golf ball to a softball. 
So he picks up five of these and puts them in his pouch. And now this shepherd's sling, uh, it would be a string uh, or, or twine uh, about six feet long, and it had a leather pouch that connected the two. On one end was a loop that they would put over their finger. On the other end was a knot that they would hold on to with their thumb, and they would put that stone in the pouch in the middle. And there's a couple different ways to do this. You could do the old cowboy rodeo swing to get that thing going. But the really advanced ones, they would get a diagonal cross swing going to really get maximum velocity. And they get that thing, fire it up, and then they would fling that thing and let go, and they could throw it with great accuracy. And the Philistine moved forward and came near to David with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth, ruddy and handsome in appearance. And the Philistine said to David, am I a dog? Did you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, come to me. Come on, boy. Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. And then David said to the Philistine, You come to me. <laughs> you come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. Highlight, circle, underline, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you down and cut off your head, and I will give the dead bodies of the host of the Philistines to this day to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, circle, highlight, underline, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord saves, not with a sword and a spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands, circle, highlight, underline. When the Philistine arose and came and drew near to David, David ran quickly toward the battle line to meet the Philistine. And David put his hand in his bag and took out a stone and slung it and struck the Philistine on his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead and he fell on his face to the ground. Here's an interesting story about those slings. You can generate enough velocity with that that as you fire it, it's equal to or close to the velocity of a 45 caliber handgun. Bam! Right between the eyes down on the ground, David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone and struck the uh, uh, Philistine and killed him. There was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine and took his sword and drew it out of his sheath and killed him and cut off his head with that. Well, there's the not safe for Sunday school version. <laughs> Don't tell that part to the kids. <laughs> And the Philistines saw that their champion was dead and they fled. So much for you will be, we will be your servants. And the men of Israel and Judah rose with a shout and pursued the Philistines as far as Gath and the gates of Ekron, so that the wounded Philistines fell on the way from Shariama, I don't know, as far as Gath and Ekron. And the people of Israel came back from chasing the Philistines and they plundered their camp. And David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. You know, tradition says that David pickled the head of the giant I don't know, that's kind of odd. As soon as Saul saw David go out against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the commander of his army, Abner, who, who, whose son is this? Like, who is this guy? Whose kid is this? Who's, who's coming into the family? I promised my daughter in marriage. Who is this guy? And the, Abner says, as your soul lives, O king, I do not know. And the king said, inquire whose son the boy is. And as soon as David returned from striking down the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine still in his hand. <laughs> hey, look what I did. <laughs> And Saul said to him, whose son are you, young man? And David answered, I am the son of your servant, Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Now, what's our application from this? Because we can read this story and go, all right, that's a great story. David killed Goliath. And like we apply it in business, you know, the, the little one that can never conquer the giant and they always conquer the giant. And you think, oh, that's not a fair fight. And it really wasn't a fair fight. But as we track through David's line of thinking, I think it's interesting to see as he progressed through the story, his attitude changed because he started out saying, hey, why doesn't somebody do something about this? He wasn't ready to get involved. He's going, well, who is this guy that he's standing and defying the armies of the living God? Why doesn't somebody do something? And he quickly progressed to, I tell you what, I'll go fight him. Those are the words. He, he's not assuring that there will be a victory. He's saying, I'll give it a shot. 
If no one else is willing to do it, money and the girl, I'm in. And that money and the girl thing is funny. That seemed to be problematic throughout uh, David's life. Later on in, in 1 Samuel, you're going to see that he struggled with sexual sin. He struggled with pride and with money. It's part of who he was, and it showed itself very early on in the story. He says, I'll go fight him. And then he says, I'll kill him. I tell you what, with God's help, I will kill him. And then to Goliath, he said, the Lord will deliver you into my hands today. He goes from, why doesn't somebody do something to full of confidence in God saying, the Lord's going to deliver you. I'm going to be the victor today. And it's real easy to read this and think, well, how do I apply this? Naturally, it's easy to assume that, man, well, if I have faith, then I should be able to conquer this. We look at uh, what, Je what David said about faith in God. Who should defy the armies of the living God? He has defied the armies of the living God. I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel. The Lord will deliver you into my hand. All that, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. The battle is the Lord's. And you go, man, David had faith, and that's why he was able to slay the giant. And it's easy to assume or to believe that then the story to us means that if I have faith in God, that I can slay my giants. Now, hopefully not a literal giant, but we have figurative giants. We all have things come up in our life. They go, man, there's no way that I can deal with this on my own. This is too big for me to deal with. But if I have faith, if I have faith like David, then I can conquer this giant. I can overcome this giant. I can have victory over my giant, whether that's illness or addiction or depression or anxiety. Hang on to that. Jesus even said, right? He said, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of a mustard seed, yeah, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. But the problem is, that's not exactly what Jesus meant with this verse. He's not saying if you have faith that everything is going to go right in your life, that you can ask for and receive everything that you want. He was more saying that if you align your heart in alignment with God's heart, then you will want the things that God wants, and then you will be able to tell the mountain to move because it will be God's will. See, we went into a challenge in our own minds when our giants don't die. Because sometimes cancer wins. Sometimes loved ones get Alzheimer's. Sometimes we can't win our battles of addiction or depression or anxiety. Sometimes we don't win. But does that mean we're hopeless? Does that mean there's no hope for any of us? I say no. There, there's a, a, a theory when you're reading the Bible because it's God's meta narrative. It's his grand story from book to beginning to book end. It tells this great sweeping story. And there's an idea in it where it's called foreshadowing, where uh, there will be something that happens early in the book that's looking forward to something that happens later in the book. And the story of David is a foreshadowing of the story of Jesus. And there's similarities that we can point to within this. If you look at it, David and Jesus were both sent to battle by their father. David and Jesus both represented their people. They stood alone in the face of insurmountable odds and fought as a representative for their people. Both were scorned and rejected by their brothers. Both fought without concern about human strategies or wisdom. Both of them won the battle. Both fought a battle where the victory was assured before the fight even started. And let me tell you this about David. David didn't win the battle when he stepped on the field with Goliath. David won it way before that. When he was out watching sheep in the field. And I can envision him tending his sheep and maybe herding them down through a valley. And sheep are stupid. Some of them will run up this hill and try to wander. Some will wander up that hill and try to wander off. And David, maybe with his sling and a stone, would hurl a rock up into the bushes and scare those sheep and chase them back down to the herd. 
fling some up there and chase them back down. The battle was won before he even faced Goliath because while he was out tending the sheep, he forged a real relationship with God, so much so that he's known as a man with a heart for God. So we look at our giants. I go, what happens when we don't win? Well, maybe we're asking the wrong question. Maybe it's not about our giants. Maybe it's about what Jesus has already done, what he's already overcome for us. Maybe it's about him conquering death, hell, and the devil forever and freeing us from the bondage that we find ourselves in. See, it's within that where we look at life in view of eternity that I can overcome anything that this life throws at me. The Bible says that our life here is like a mist and it's gone. But when you're in a relationship with Jesus, you are assured of eternity with him. And so it's in that freedom that I lean into my relationship. When the giants come at me and regardless of my faith, if I put it in Jesus, I know that he's already overcome every single one of my giants, regardless of how it plays out here on this earth. He's already won the battle. And all I have to do is put my faith in him. And come what may, I'm assured of eternity with him. A couple of quick application points, and I'll do this quick. I know we're running along. For those of us in the church, that's where our freedom comes from. From within that relationship with Christ. That regardless of what we face, we lean in fully knowing that he's already won our battles. Second thing is a church as a whole, we lean into continuing to reach out beyond these four walls to impacting our communities, homes, and workplaces to share this message of salvation and grace to people who maybe never heard it before or never heard it the way that this book tells it. And if you're here this morning and you haven't crossed that line of faith, maybe it's time, maybe it's time that you went all in and give your giant over to a God who's already defeated it, who loves you more than you know, who's done everything that you could never do to repair this relationship with you so that you could be with him forever and eternity. See, I know that we will never beat all of our giants because we have to have faith in the one who's already conquered our giants. Even Jesus supports this idea when in John 16, 13, he says, I say these things to you that in me you may have peace. Regardless of your giants, I say this so that you can have peace in me, in the world, you will have tribulation, but take heart because I've overcome the world and I want you to have peace. Would you pray? Father God, we come before you this morning. We thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the examples that we find within it. God, I pray that everyone in this room and watching online would have a heart to know more about who you are, why you came, and how that impacts the way we live our lives, regardless of the giants that we face. And then maybe, God, just maybe, even in the midst of our pain, and even in the midst of our struggle, those are the times when we draw closest to you loving you for what you've done, giving you all the glory and praise for what is to come. God, we love you and pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.